Historically, the church has engaged culture in a relevant way in four different ways. One of those ways is health care. Uh, for instance, we as Christians were one of the first people to respond to the issue of the plague uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, we were the ones who would tend to the dying and care for their families. And we would reach out to people that nobody else wanted to touch. Uh, that is the, uh, the moment that the word hospital literally comes from. And because of that grace and because of that ministry, the church was able to uh, sustain a witness in the Middle Ages because of the credibility of the ministry. Uh, Mother Teresa picked that up as she witnessed to and ministered to the dying lepers in Calcutta, to a group of people that nobody else wanted to touch. And she went in there and cared for these folks with such, with such uh, a love of Christ that the world gave her a platform that nobody could take away. Uh, we live in a time now where health care is more and more confusing. And because of the confusion, there are more and more people who literally do not have access to the system. They, they don't know how to work it. They don't know how to get in. And so now there's another opportunity, e even in Middle Tennessee, for our church to reach out to our culture through the ministry of health care. Uh, the second one is poverty. Uh, the church has done well throughout history as it is ministered to the poor. The first thing the gospel does is it returns dignity, restores dignity to a person. And they understand that their worth is in Christ and the, and the price that Christ paid for them. And then they begin to live in an entirely different way. Uh, the relationships change, marriages change, the way that they parent their children change, uh, their attitude toward work changes. And so the church has historically done very well at this. Even in Middle Tennessee, we will want to be involved with those men and women uh, who want to see this cycle broken in their own lives, and it will literally take the power of the resurrected Christ to see that done. The third is education. Uh, as, as you know, most of the, the schools of higher learning in our nation were started by Christians who believed that loving God with their mind was uh, a, a substantial commandment given to us by Christ, and that all truth is God truth. And to understand something about the way the biology of humanity works is to understand something about the God who created humanity. Uh, and so all of that happens when you begin to engage um, with uh, elementary schools and middle schools and already uh, the church in Nashville and the church uh, at Station Hill have set up key relationships with nearby schools beginning to make a difference in the lives of those teachers, principals, and the students. All of this of course leads to an opportunity of evangelism. Now. When I first started in ministry, longer than I want to tell you, uh, we were trained that, that evangelism started when you opened the Bible and said, the Bible says, uh, the, the, the famous Billy Graham quote, the Bible says, and that's where you would begin the conversation. Because everybody you would talk to understood the Bible. Now, they may not obey it. Uh, they may not have read it. Uh, but they understood that this was God's Word and it had a certain place in the church and therefore in culture. Now you open up the Bible and the per person you're talking to would say, what's that? And you would say, well, this is the Bible. And they would say, well, that's nice. How is it different? And they will list all of the other books of religion, all the other holy books or all the other sacred writers, some of them written by spiritualists of the day, and that they will quote and find meaningful from, and meaning from, I told you several years ago, uh, that uh, when um, we started the preaching team and got a research assistant, the first thing the research assistant did was order O Magazine, which was highly embarrassing to me to have that in my mailbox. And when I mentioned to Carla, who was serving as research at the time, I said, I'm not going to have O Magazine sent to my mailbox at the church. Her response, this is the spiritual leader of the women of our culture. You need to know what she's saying to these women. So now you have to spend a lot of time in philosophy, how we know things, what things are important to know, before we ever get to the issue of theology and who Jesus is and, and, and begin to tell the story there. 
Uh, so, so it's a very interesting but, and changing time. It can be very frustrating because we are, we've all grown up with this instant evangelism. I tell you the story of Jesus, you respond, and we go get you baptized. Those are great stories. It doesn't happen that way too much anymore. It happens very, very slowly over a period of weeks, months, and yes, sometimes years of a constant conversation that will finally lead to somebody responding. And that's very frustrating to us. Uh, but, but that's the way that, that it's working out. One of the reasons it works that way is because people have not seen any authentic life change from the gospel. Uh, I tell you all the time that the world is not mad at us because we're different. They're mad at us because we're not different enough. Uh, when you do the studies, uh, divorce is the same in the church as is outside the church. Um, uh, addiction is the same in the church as it is outside the church. There's no real difference between all of those studies and the quality of life from believers and non-believers. So people are looking for some kind of authenticity to the message before they'll give it any kind of credibility. Uh, a recent story proves this point. Uh, most of you are, know Malcolm Gladwell, the famous writer uh, who wrote Tipping Point and some other books like that. He has a new book out called uh, David and Goliath. And in a recent magazine article in Relevant Magazine, he talked about his return to faith as he wrote this book. And the reason he said he returned to faith is he saw evidence of power, of God's power that he had not seen. And, and he saw it in a couple of stories that he was doing. One of the stories was a Christian community in World War II that hid Jewish refugees. Now, this was a group of seminary students uh, and uh, uh, folks who were studying the Word all the time who thought it was their duty to, to protect the poor and to protect those who were being abused by society, and that, of course, were the Jewish refugees. So this group of Christians hid Jewish refugees. Now, they had the commandment, do not lie. And they didn't know what to do. Was this something that, <laughs> that you know, you could do to protect the lives of people? And this, this was a moral dilemma in this community. And finally, they agreed that they would tell the Germans the truth. And that when the Germans asked, they would say, yes, we are hiding Jews, and here's why. And they would preach the gospel every time they were asked. So when the German colonel came through and said, we hear you're hiding Jewish refugees, the leader, the pastor of the, of the community said, yes, we are, and here's why, and preached. Now, this happened every time somebody asked somebody in this community, are you hiding Jews? Yes, here's why. This is what Jesus taught us to do. Let us tell you about Jesus. To the point that people wanted to avoid the sermon that they kind of left the little community alone. He also studied the response of the Amish community to the tragic school shooting. You remember that a few years ago. Where the Amish community forgave the gunman and then reached out to the mother of that gunman and attended that gunman's funeral with her because they said she too lost her child. They offered forgiveness and had a wonderful testimony about the power of Christ to, that enables us to deal with the worst moments of life. And because of that, Malcolm Gladwell, who grew up in a Christian home, has returned to the practice of his faith because he was able to see the power of changed lives. So today we're going to read a very familiar passage of Scripture. You're going to hear about power and you're going to scratch your head and wonder why we do not see more evidence of that in our own lives and in the life of our church. And that's what we're going to talk about today, Acts chapter 1. Stand with me in honor of God's Word. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And after he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud received him out of their sight. 
And while he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken away from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Bring us this power that we may be your witnesses from here to the ends of the earth. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, if you have spent any time around Brentwood Baptist Church, you have heard Acts 1-8. Uh, it's on most of the stuff that we print out. It's on most of the information we give you that we're an Acts 1-8 church. This is Acts 1-8. And we'll quote it uh, when we want to do something. You know, this is in keeping with our Acts 1-8 ministry. And we'll give you the verse again. And so, we run the risk of when uh, we come to you and read this passage of you going, okay, I know what this means, and closing your mind. Uh, and so, you think you know where I'm going. You think, okay, you're going really, to really land on this word uh, witness, which is the Greek word martyr, uh, that we get the word martyr from, and how you have to share your story, and how you can't bring hearsay. Hearsay is not admissible in the court. You can't say what somebody else said. You have to know what you have seen, and that's the story you bring. Um, no, we're not going to get that to that today. Or you're going to say, oh, I know where this is going. With the Middle Tennessee Initiative and everything, he's going to tell us about how we break the world up into our Jerusalem and our Judea and our Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And you're going to help us understand where those areas are for us and then how we can break them down. And then we're going to form committees for each of these areas. And we're going to vote on programs, and we will have a whole lot of meetings and a whole lot of discussion, and we'll print out a whole lot of pamphlets, and at the end of it, nothing will change. Okay, most of us have been into a Baptist church long enough that the last thing we want to see is another program. More meetings, more money, not a whole lot to change. So you're kind of thinking, okay, I know where Mike's going. He's going to tell us we really need to do more, rah, rah. Maybe we can get through this one without too much damage. Not so fast. We probably won't even get to that today. We probably won't even get to the part about the martyr, about the, the, being the witness. Not yet today. What we're going to talk about today is that stuff that we're seeing with the power. See the first part of the verse? You will receive power... When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, the first thing you ought to connect that to is that literally happens in Acts chapter 2. Uh, when the church is in the upper room praying, the Spirit does come. But there was a long time between when Jesus said you would get the power and when the power actually comes. Now, I know when I have said the Holy Spirit will come on you, a lot of us have gone, oh me, not today. I don't know if I really want this. Because we have this thing that if you are filled with the Spirit, or if the Spirit is in you, or if you've had some encounter with the Spirit, then you are one strange duck. Okay? Now, I'm, it's just you and me talking. Okay? We have known people who claim to be in the Spirit, and God bless them. We just didn't want what they had. Okay, now come on, we're we, we keeping it real now. Uh, we have always assumed that if somebody was very emotional in their worship, if they cried a lot when they prayed, if they couldn't be still during a worship service, then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And if they raised their hands, you know why Baptists don't raise their hands, don't you? God may call on us. We don't want no. <laughs> We're not sure that we want that. 
We're not sure that we want to stand before Jesus and Jesus will do anything that you want us to do. We'll go anywhere. We'll bear any price. We'll do anything that you want us to do. Yeah, I know. We sing these songs that we will do anything Jesus asks us to do. But in the back of our head, we're saying, yeah, but I keep veto power. I don't mind doing some of the things Jesus asked me to do, but let's face it. There are people doing some strange things right now and they're doing it because they said Jesus told them to do it. I mean, I went to South Africa. I talked to some of our friends, people who were in this church one Sunday. They're in South Africa the next Sunday. How do you think they got there? Jesus, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Boom, South Africa. They don't even have cable in some parts of South Africa. They get the ball game way later than we do. Now, I'm being halfway funny. But a lot of us think that, don't we? I don't know if I want to do what Jesus wants me to do. I want veto power. I want to be able to negotiate. I want to be able to say, no, Jesus, I won't do that, but I'll probably do this. I'll go this far, but not that far. Does it not strike you as the least bit foolish to be standing in front of the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, seeing in His hands the scars that paid for our salvation, knowing there was no limit to what He would do for our salvation, and then have the gall to tell Jesus, there are things I won't do for you. So the power doesn't come. The other part is we don't want it. Uh, we, we don't. I, let, me, let, me tell you, let me tell you one of the other things that happened in South Africa. Okay, you know I, I went to South Africa, I prayed with John. And we're, we're in his house uh, that Tuesday morning. I'm washing his feet. I'm praying for him. And John had been real sick with his tick bite fever. In fact, he had night sweats every night, sometimes two and three times a night. He would get up, have to change his pajamas, have to change the sheets on the bed, wake up just drenched. And, and you can't get any kind of decent rest if you're getting up every two hours. And so his body was wearing out. He was frustrated. And so I'm washing his feet. John, how do I pray for you? And he says, if you can pray that I can sleep. Okay. That's what we prayed for. Well, the next morning, early, he calls me at Joey Langford's house. Get Mike on the phone. Get Mike on the phone. Morning, John. How are you? I am fantastic. I slept all night long. I didn't get up one time. That's great, John. Mike, you have the gift of healing. <laughs> oh, no. I, see, I, I'm thinking I've got to go get a bus now and drive. I don't want to do that. I, See, what happens if you're anointed with a gift from the Spirit? We're not sure that we want that because it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to get to the point to realize that you cannot fix what is broken. There are things wrong with our nation. There are things wrong with our family that unless Jesus himself steps into this moment, into this process, they will not change. They will continue to spin out of control. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Well, you and I know that. But it's hard for us to admit as modern 21st century Americans that there's not something we can do. Well, surely there's somebody we can call. Surely there's something we can do. There is something we can invent. There's an organization we can form, and we can fix this problem. And now doctors are beginning to tell us that people are having a hard time understanding the limits of medicine. 
Because now when they tell a family, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do, or I'm sorry, the disease has run its course, that everybody thinks there's one more medicine that the person can take that will heal them. And sometimes doctors can't do that. But it's hard for us, isn't it, to understand the limits of what we can do. It's hard for us to understand as a church that there are things wrong in our own lives, in in the life of our church, in the life of our families, that we cannot fix by forming another committee. It's hard, isn't it, to realize that there are things stuck in your life that you cannot get out unless Jesus removes them. It's hard, isn't it, to realize that there are things against which there are enemies that we cannot defeat. There are things we cannot get out of our lives. There are battles we cannot win. And it's in that moment when you drop your hands and surrender and defeat and tell Jesus, I can't. It's hard to get there. And that's why the world keeps us so busy. Have you noticed this? I mean, it, it's been kind of subtle before. Now it is blatant. We're trying to get you to a place where you are never, ever disconnected from the propaganda of the world. Never. Now we're developing a contact lens. This is true. A contact lens where we can put the television directly on your eyeball. You don't even have to turn the TV on. It's on the eyeball the whole time. Now we have people who will have an anxiety attack if they're disconnected from their phone. How many of you have taken your children to a place where where there's no service? Dad, I can't get any bars. What what am I going to do? I don't know. You know, we lived for a long time without bars. (laughs) And we did well. There are people who will have anxiety attacks if the battery goes out because they feel like they're totally disconnected. Some of you will not turn your phone off during prayer because somebody more important than Jesus may call you. Really? Really? Because you don't want to be disconnected. You don't want to be out of the loop. You don't want to show up to work and somebody say, uh, did you hear about it? And you, and you missed that little message that told you that something had happened and you weren't ready to comment on it. And you look out of the loop, you look a little slow, you look like you're not with it. Jesus would go into the wilderness away from the demands of the disciples, away from the demands of his world. And as his habit, he would spend time alone with the Father. How hard it is for us to find time alone with Jesus. The world wants you busy. The world wants your life cluttered. The world wants you running here and there. The world wants you at this meeting and that meeting and that event and this event because you do not have time to sit still and understand that unless Jesus shows up in your life, you're not going to make it. So read another email. Trace another link. Do something until your eyes are too tired to hold open and go to sleep one more day. And you'll never know the power. Because when you turn everything off and it's just you, when you disconnect from everything and it's just you, then you begin to understand that there's not a lot you can do. Not in your own strength, not in your own power. Jesus will have to come. And Jesus says he will come. The Spirit will come. And it's interesting in the way that, that Luke wrote Luke and Acts. Luke wrote both of those volumes. And sometimes it's a little frustrating that we have divided Luke from Acts with the, with the, uh, with the Gospel of John in between. He wrote both volumes. Uh, We think both were written to a a Roman official to explain that the Christian faith was not a threat to the Roman Empire and that Paul's mission was was carrying out the mission of Jesus. And if you understood that, then you would understand the role of Paul. Um, 
And, and at the end of Luke, we have chapter 24, which bleeds almost directly into Acts 1. In fact, there's all, there is some kind of overlay. There's some kind of connection, literally, where the words are almost exactly the same in Luke 24 and, and Acts 1. Now, this is interesting because when, when Luke says in chapter 2 that Jesus said, the Spirit will come upon you, they would have understood it the same way that they had seen Jesus work in Luke 24. The Holy Spirit is nothing more, nothing less than the experience of the risen Christ in our lives now. Okay, most of what you now say is Jesus is actually the role of the Spirit. But we don't understand all of that. So sometimes we speak out of our, our, out of our experience. And, and so, but most of what we know, most of the encounter we have is the Spirit. Look at what Jesus did in Acts 24. It's the famous story, the road to Emmaus. And it's after the resurrection, there's two men, Cleopas and a friend, walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a little village about seven miles outside Jerusalem. As they're walking, a stranger joins them. He asked them, what are you talking about? Are you the only one who doesn't know? And they explained to him everything that happened about Jesus and the crucifixion. The stranger then says, did you know that it is written in the Word that the Messiah must come, must suffer and be, and, and, uh, and, and be raised from the dead? And he explains from the Scripture about the life of the Messiah. As they're talking, they come to the village and they say, stay with us. And he stays with them and, 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 and shares the supper with them. He breaks the bread. As he breaks the bread, he prays. As he prays, they recognize who he is. And it's Jesus who's been walking with them the whole time. And that's the story of Easter in the Gospel of Luke. The story of this Jesus who walks with his children. The story of the Spirit who will never leave you by yourself. One who walks alongside. The Gospel of John calls him the paraclete. Para meaning alongside, clete literally meaning to walk. The one who walks alongside you. The one who walks alongside with you and teaches you. The one who walks alongside of you and reveals all truth. The one who walks alongside of you and confirms the presence of the risen Christ in your life. But before you get there, you have to be dead empty. As empty as Cleopas was when he said to Jesus in Luke 24, we had hoped. We had hoped that he would be the one to change save our nation. We had hoped, but we don't hope anymore. It's hard, isn't it, to know that there's nothing you can do. To be pulled back from the burning house knowing it's too late to go in. To have the code called by the doctor calling out the time of death, pulling off his or her gloves and telling the nurses and the respiratory therapists to clean up that there's nothing more they can do. It's hard, isn't it, to read the paper about despite all of our efforts, the addiction to methamphetamine continues to grow in Tennessee. And to realize there's not a whole lot you can do about it because it's not the meth that's the problem. It's the hole in these young people's lives and these people's lives who are trying to medicate the pain from the absence of Jesus. So you want to do something about that bad feeling. You want to get away from it as fast as you can. So usually what we'll do is we'll turn the TV on. We'll find somewhere to go. We will wander in circles in the mall because we just don't want to feel bad. We'll go somewhere and get a cup of coffee. We'll meet some friends for dinner or something because we don't want to feel bad. And we'll go somewhere because we don't want to feel like this. And it is that feeling bad, it is that emptiness, it is that hurt that won't go away. It is the beginning of the healing. So don't run from it. 
It's where it starts, where your arms fall and surrender and you say, Jesus, there's nothing I can do. I can do all things. Paul says, through him who gives me strength. Far be it from me to brag, he writes, except in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is not I who live, but he in me. On and on the verses go about what happens when Christ comes and lives in and through you. The power that brings, the difference that makes. Thousands of people in Middle Tennessee do not know Jesus Christ. Thousands of children are hungry in Middle Tennessee. Countless numbers of them are bright and gifted and literally will not have a chance because the cycle of poverty has them again. And when you look at the numbers and when you look at what's out there and you say, we can't do this. That's the place you start. Because when you wait, Jesus says, I will come. And when I come, I'll bring power, the same power that defeated death. That's the power I'll bring to you. But it's not just a sitting with your hands folded kind of waiting. It is a waiting of preparation. It is a waiting of looking in your own life. Is there anything in my life that will hinder Jesus from working? Is there any grudge I haven't forgiven? Is there any sin I haven't confronted? Is there anything in my life I need to straighten out so Jesus can work? Is there anything in my life that will keep hinder him from working in my life right now? Is there anything I need to learn? Yeah, you need to be in the Word so you'll know how Jesus works when he begins to lead you. So I'll be ready when he finally says go. But until he does, we wait for the power that can change the world. And it doesn't come from you, nor me, but only from him.